Good morning. Thanks for being here. It's good to be back. Last Sunday, I attended church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, called the Church of the Servant. I attended the basic English service there, and it was really amazing. There were immigrants and refugees from all over the world. I think I heard five different languages at least spoken, including Swahili, French, Iranian, and some Asian languages. There were at least 90 people present. It was truly amazing to see the diversity of the body of Christ. And oh, that God would open the floodgates here and give us that kind of a blessing. Uh, The presence of God filled that room. Uh, It was a wonderful thing to behold, and it gave me great hope for the future. Um, We are, and it's good to be back, uh, and uh, we are going to pick up in Acts And we'll read the last couple of verses from chapter 6 to refresh our memories and then go into chapter 7. I'll start with the end of verse 13 in chapter 6. And now what we're basically going to be reading here is the Cliff Notes version of the Old Testament. Uh, Some, you know, uh, I will occasionally stop and highlight some things. Uh, But for the most part, I'll give it to you whole. Um, So basically, it starts like this. This man, Stephen, incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting at the council saw his face like the face of an angel. If you remember last week, I think it was last week. I wasn't here, but I think I said this. um, That... His face glowing was exactly like Moses. Moses' face glowed. The presence of God was on so so much. And so he was basically saying, uh, God was basically saying, this guy is just like Moses. He has the same authority that Moses had. And again, we're going to see in this whole process, and I'll probably say this again later on, You know, we always think it's the apostles that do all of the great things. I hate to tell you, but the the deacons did more amazing things than the apostles did. I mean, they did some pretty freaky stuff. Your face glowing is pretty freaky in and of itself. Um, So they fixed their gaze on him, saw his face like the face of an angel. The high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, hear me. Brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to them, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. And he left the land of Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, when he had no child, he promised him that he would give it to him as a possession, and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, and they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they would be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave them the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and, the circ- and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him and rescued him from all his affliction and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there He and our fathers died. Now, I'm just going to stop for just a minute here. Why is Stephen telling this to people who have heard it every day since they were born? Right? 
He's not telling them anything new here. He's laying the foundation for their end and the beginning of the church. From there, they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. But as the time of promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our people and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in word and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered into his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended them and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brother, brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together. And he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you not, you do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? Word travels fast. Uh, At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground." I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. Now this Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of an angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. The man let them out, performing wonders in the signs and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This Moses who is said to the sons of Israel, God will raise you up, raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. This is the one who was in a congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him at Mount Sinai. And who was with our fathers, and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, "Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him." At the time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? Did did you just hear what he said? The entire time they were in the wilderness, they were not worshiping God. They were worshiping the hosts of heaven. Um, And so you also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the God of Rampha, images which you made to worship, and I will also remove you beyond Babylon. Uh, Let me stop there and make a couple of statements. First, Stephen calls the Holy Spirit an angel at least twice in that passage. And when he's, talking about the, when he's talking about the burning bush and when he's talking about uh, the person, the, the thing speaking to him uh, on Mount Sinai and with him in the wilderness, he calls him an angel. 
Uh, you know, we get real technical about those things. Uh, the Bible doesn't get all that technical about those things. It was the presence of God. Um, and um, also, that when God turned them away, he let them worship the host of heaven. Again, angels. He let them worship angels that weren't God. Uh, they were angels with the God of Moloch and God Rampa, images which they made to worship. It's important to understand that when they made the images of the host of heaven to worshiping them, they were transforming themselves into less than what God wanted them to be. Let me explain. See, human beings are created to be the image of God. When we stop worshiping God and start worshiping idols, we are giving away who we are. Okay? There's not supposed to be an image in the temple of God because we are the image of God. And in fact, now that Christ has come, there is no temple. We are also the temple and the image. We are everything that God wants. He doesn't need anything else. He needs us to walk in obedience with him and be his temple and his image in the world. Um, so when we refuse to walk humbly with God and be his image on earth, then God purposely turns over, turns us over to servants until we learn our lesson. Okay? Israel as a nation never learned its lesson. Individuals from every tongue, tribe, and nation will humble themselves before God and become the true nation of Israel, but no one who refuses, uh, but anyone who refuses to walk humbly with God will ever be a part of it. No one. You refuse to walk humbly with God, you will never be a part of Israel. You will never find life. You will only find death. Back in verse 44, we read, Our fathers and the tabernacle of testimony had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, uh, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought, with it, brought it in with jo uh, Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might be, make, find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High God does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is a footstool for my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what kind of place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? In that statement, Stephen is dissing the worship that's going on in the temple. He is repudiating it. It means nothing to God. The building means nothing to God. He wants a people that he can dwell in. We need to remember that Israel having a king and a temple was God's plan B. That's not what he wanted. His preferred method was that the people would simply walk humbly with him. They refused, and therefore he gave them what they wanted, which was to be like all the other nations and have a king. And what happened when they got their second king? Their second king became exactly like all the other kings in the world. You read the passage of what Solomon did, and he was mimicking all of the pagan nations. He had over 3,000 wives, concubines and wives. Why? Because he was building relationships with other nations and politicking and trying to govern the kingdom of God like the kingdom of the world. And it destroyed Israel. Absolutely destroyed it. 
That's why God said, I don't want you to have a king. I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king myself. I want you to be my temple. But if you won't, if you, if you won't humble yourself for me, then I'll give you a king and a temple. But I won't be present in either one of them. Those are the things that we oftentimes miss when we read the Old Testament. Um, you know, I think that we here in our day and age are in much the same boat. He's given us what we wanted, but it wasn't and it isn't what he wants for us. Um, so then Stephen let the religious leaders have it. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just like your fathers did. Now let me stop there because when he tells them that they are uncircumcised in heart, he is reminding them that they are still in exile. Even though they're living in Jerusalem, they are still in exile because the promise of getting out of exile from Deuteronomy 30 starts with, I will circumcise your heart. So he says, your hearts are uncircumcised. You're still in exile. God has not delivered you from the powers that be. The hosts of heaven are who you are serving, but not the living God. God's spirit had been removed from them. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit hadn't been in the temple for over, for over six or 700 years. They'd been wandering in the wilderness for that long. Stephen reminds them why they're still in exile. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? In other words, who, whenever you heard God speak to you, why did you always persecute the person that was speaking? And in fact, every time you, uh, uh, God spoke to you through the prophets, you rejected them. That's, that's harsh words. Harsh words. Uh, was there all, were, were there people who sometimes did believe? Yes, but the nation as a whole, the world as a whole, rejects the call of the Holy Spirit. He's telling the absolute truth. But you don't really want to do that to self-righteous church people who ignore the truth of the word of God so they can be in positions of power. That's exactly who he's talking here, to here. What happened next was probably inevitable. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick. He pushed the knife in and twisted it, but it didn't kill them. It just made them mad. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he had gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing next to the Father, the right hand of God in the place of power, king over heaven and earth. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold it against them. He wasn't mad at these people. He wanted God to transform them. That's why he was in the temple preaching to begin with. And having said that, he fell asleep. I think it's interesting. You know, I, I want to make a kind of a clarity here. Sometimes, most of the time, maybe not most of the time, but many times, the scriptures call this thing we call death going to sleep. And, and I think that that is a, a better notion than 
death. Why? Because we're all born dead. We're already dead. We don't know what living is. So we think, oh, I'm all worried about death. No, you're just going to go to sleep. It's just a question of where you're going to wake up. Right? Uh, God <laughs> has got this under control. Um, and we can trust that death is not the end. This thing, this physical, end of physical existence in this age is not the end. And just so you know, church, self-righteous church members can be as deadly as pagan, uh, angry pagans. Anyone who's opposed to the Holy Spirit actually doing something in believers' lives can easily be offended by the Holy Spirit actually doing something in the world. I believe that perse the persecution to come will probably be a tag team match with unbelievers in both the world and the church going after anyone who's being used by the Spirit to do the work of God. Uh, just like it is right there, Romans and the unbelievers, unbelieving church people going after the church. Chapter 8 tells us uh, that those people were in hearty agreement in putting Stephen to death. Paul was in hearty agreement. Saul, I'm sure. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church of Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen, made a loud lamentation over him, but Saul began, to ra began ravaging the church entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing, um, they were giving attention to him as he so, said those things. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Here we see another deacon doing the same things that the apostles did, signs and wonders, and next week he's going to really blow our minds. With the, the Holy Spirit's really going to blow our minds with what he did through a deacon. Um, in fact, we shall soon see God pour out as much or more amazing works through the deacons than are noted about most of the apostles. Uh, now, verse 9 says there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing people in Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And I want you to understand, our, uh, our term for magic and their term for magic, two totally different things. Uh, when we think of magic, we think of sleight of hand. I still do not know how they slight their hands in some of those things. Like the one guy I saw who was standing on the street and threw a card against a glass window and it was on the other side of the window. And the, I have no, and the people on the inside peeled it off. I don't know how that happens, okay? But this guy wasn't doing sleight of hand. He was doing powerful things through spirits. That's the kind of magic they had back then. Um, we don't believe in anything except sleight of hand in our day and age. They understood the world, the spiritual world, to be powerful and active on both sides of the field. Um, and so they were giving him attention for, because for a long time he, established, he, he astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. Now understand, Simon believed. That's simple. After being baptized, he continued on with Philip and he observed signs and great miracles taking place and he was constantly amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, 
who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They began laying their hands on him, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the passage where we get the notion of laying on of hands to receive the Spirit. Um, and um, I wouldn't call it a second blessing. That's just not my, my terminology. I don't think that's right. I would say it was simply an equipping so that the good news of Jesus could be presented not just with words, but with power. And I think that's what separates the West from the New Testament. We love to proclaim the gospel in word, but the gospel in word alone is not enough. Because this is not an intellectual proposition. We have words coming out the wazoo, but that's all we have. People cannot be reasoned into the kingdom of God. And the farther away we get from the 19th century, the more that that statement is true. Reason will bring no one under, oh, under 30 to the gospel anymore because they do not believe in reason with good reason. Okay. They understand what they have been taught. And they believe it. Um, you know, the power of positive thinking doesn't even work anymore. Or the power of argument doesn't work. Uh, you can see that all around us. We have two tribes, probably more than two tribes, but we have two main tribes in this country. And they argue and argue and argue, but they argue past each other. Because they don't want a solution, they just want to argue. Because they think that is what matters. And if I can't have it my way, you're not going to get it your way. If that is not our culture today, well, uh, I must be watching something else. I must be living in another planet. Uh, because that's what I see every single day. And, and I'm here to tell you, both sides are equally wrong. Both sides in this tribe, both tribes are equally wrong. There's only one tribe, and it is the tribe of Jesus Christ. I, it breaks my heart to see the church divided. I, I work at a United Methodist Church, and I am brokenhearted because they are splitting again. But you see, it's not, it's the same old story. It's the same reason they split at the Civil War, because they cannot find a solution for the problem. They can't find a solution for the problem between left and right, because there is no solution for the problem of left and right in our nation except Jesus Christ bringing us into him. And both sides coming together and loving one another. I need my brothers and sisters on the left to breathe deep the breath of God. And I need my brothers and sisters on the right to breathe deep the breath of God. Because it's only the breath of God that will transform us into the people of God. As long as we're left and right, we are not the people God, because God is over all. He is Lord of all. And guess what? The homosexual can be saved just as much as the pornographer. The Holy, the Holy Spirit can save the alcoholic just as much as he can save the heroin addict. The gospel can reach the poor man as much as it can reach the man sitting behind the the powers of the world, the banks, or whatever. All people have to humble themselves before God or there's no hope for any of them. This whole concept of he's a worse sinner than I am is a lie from hell. No one is a worse sinner than you. And no one is a worse sinner than me. I am better than no one. 
And unless Jesus Christ dies for me and raises me from the dead and produces the fruits of the Spirit in me, I have nothing to offer God. There is not a person since the fall of Adam and Eve who have had any bit of standing before God. No one, no one, no one is righteous before God. No one. Only Jesus Christ, the second Adam, is righteous. And if, unless we are found in him, by God, I can't wait to, to, to embrace some former homosexuals in heaven. I can't wait to embrace some former drunks in heaven. I can't wait to embrace some former Pharisees in heaven because I'll be one of them. Been a Pharisee almost all my life. And God is doing something crazy in me that I cannot turn away from. And I will not turn away from it. I'm blessed by God to be in these times. Believing in Jesus is a miracle. It's not a decision that you make. It is a miracle. It is something that happens to you. You can't do it by your own will. You can't read the scriptures and get saved by your own intellectual power. Good grief. Most of the people who have been saved over the course of life, over, uh, of the history of the world, couldn't even read. They didn't use the Bible as some kind of a textbook that they, if you do this, this, and this, you get saved. That is a creation of the modern world. Just walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God, and he will deliver you. I promise. The word promises that. See, salvation requires at least one, minute, one miracle in order to be true salvation. You have to be raised from the dead. You already are dead. If you're not in Christ, you're dead. You're not asleep yet but you're dead. You were born dead. You know, you weren't born innocent. This so, I saw something yesterday about uh, abortion and all these innocent children being, those children aren't innocent. None of those children are innocent. They're all guilty before God the Father. Because why? Because they're human beings and there's not a human being except Jesus Christ who is not worthy of death. None whatsoever. Oh, that we would remember that. And cry out to God that he would change our hearts. Uh, we have to learn that we have to die to ourselves before we can live into God. That can only be accomplished, only be accomplished by the power of the Spirit. May God bless each and every one of us here with such a miracle if it hasn't already happened. Let's close with prayer. Oh, Father. I ask right now that you would allow everyone in this room to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever that means, for each and every person here, that they may be delivered from themselves, killed so that they can be raised to new life in Christ. Produce the fruits of the, of the Spirit in abundance in everyone here in the days that we have left. Do what it takes to make us like you, which simply means pour out your Spirit on us now and begin to produce the fruits of the Spirit in us. I ask that you would give everyone whom you touch today with a sign that they would know in their heart that you've started something new in their lives. Even if they've had the Spirit for 50 or more years, I ask this in the power and authority of Jesus, King of heaven and earth. Please make it so. Amen. Thank you, guys.